those verses just kept coming. I don't think we're going to sing all of them. This will this will be our uh, song prayer this morning. Ere you wrap your room this morning, did you think to pray in the name of Christ our Savior? Did you sue for loving favor as a shield today? Oh, how praying rests the weary. Prayer can a night today. So when life seems dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. When you met her, did you say to pray? By his dying love and merit, did you claim the Holy Spirit as your guide and stay? Oh, how playing rests the weary. Prayer will change the night today. So when life seems dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. When your heart was filled with anger, Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather here the first day of the week. Lord, we ask that you help each of us to rid our minds of the world and to focus on you and your son. 
Lord, as we come before you, we ask the blessings and healings on those that are on our sick list. Lord, the, the list is long and there's no doubt there's many on on the hearts and minds of people here that are, on, are not on that list. But be with all of those, please. Or be with those that are administering to them and help them to uh, find the, the relief and need they so desperately need. Lord, be with the uh, elders here. Bless them or give them wisdom and courage and strength to be making the right decisions for, for the flock here or give them clarity of thought. Be with Michael as he works here with us. Be with his family. Bless them. Be with Jason, his family, and bless them as well. Lord, uh, we ask that you bless this nation. Help us to find our way back to looking towards your way. Or be with the leaders of this nation and just be with as much the citizens of this nation to uh, help us to get back on the right track. Or be with us as we go through the balance of this service. We thank you so much, but most of all, we thank you for Christ. His name we pray. Amen. be reading from Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything be by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He paid a debt, he did not owe, I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing, a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. He paid that debt at Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me, to live with him eternally, won't it be glory to see him on that day? I then will sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Christ the Lord has risen today. Alleluia. Sons of man and angels say, Alleluia. Grace. Oops. Hallelujah! Sing ye heaven and earth reply. Hallelujah! Let's lower that. This is the last verse. <clears throat> Lives again our glorious King. Ah, hallelujah. 
Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting? Ah, hallelujah. One seed, ah, hallelujah. Is thy victory boasting brave? I appreciate Jeff for trying to make that one work. I've never sung that in my life, but so just did, so we'll hopefully sing it again. But if you come to Wednesday night service and you see me do a Devo, you'll know that I like to use props. And guess what? I have one this morning for communion. So last Sunday, Miss Cheryl Anderson gave me this little dog statue. And this little statue represents our dog, Rufus, that just passed away a few weeks ago. It looks exactly like him aside for the white spot that he has on his chest right now. And he was the greatest dog to ever live. And this is what I have to sit on a shelf in our dining room to remember him. And also a wooden cross that has his name engraved on it. So this little statue helps me remember all the great memories with Rufus from childhood up until a few months ago. But do we get that same remark from this little cracker? A little cup of juice. The greatest man to ever live, the Son of God, and something small that he gives you to make sure you remember the blood and the, his body that he sacrificed for us. He was killed for you, and if you were the only person alive on earth today, he would still die for you on the cross. A man that loves you so much, he shed his life to save yours. Matthew 26, 26 says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let's pray for the bread. Dear most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessing to have all of us come together this morning to celebrate the life that your son lived. We pray for this bread that you'll help us remember the body that your, blood, or the body that your son gave us on the cross to die for us so that we may live eternally with you. In Jesus' name we pray. It goes on to say in verse 27, He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray for the cup. Dear most gracious and heavenly Father, we, th uh, we come to you again this morning to ask a blessing over this cup of juice that we're about to take, that you would help us remember the blood that your son shed on the cross for us, so that we may live eternally with you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Giving money back to the church is something that the Lord commanded us to do in Proverbs. As it says in Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with he um lost my words. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with he first fruits of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats bursting with wine. Giving money back helps us continue the great works that we do here, helps keep this building up, helps the youth do cool, great, fun trips, and also uh, helps the Lord's work continue and spread. So let's pray for the offering. Dear most gracious and heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning to say thank you for the your son and how you sent him to die for us and that you'll help us continue the work that we do here, Lord, and how uh, you help us continue to keep spreading your word so that we more people will be able to hear the good news of Jesus. And I pray that the people that decide to give this morning, that that money will go to a good cause. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I'm not really sure I, why I got up here and stood in front of you at this time. Could have been that Josiah was, uh, he left and automatically I got up and stood here. So I was standing here looking at you while we were doing our communion this morning, or the offering this morning, so I apologize for that. We're going to go ahead and dismiss the youths at this time. And as we do that, we're going to sing this song before... Michael's lesson. Lord, make me a servant. Lord, make me like you. For you are a servant. Lord, make me one too. Lord, make me a servant. Do what you must do to make me a servant, Lord, make me like you. Lord, make me morning. So this morning we are doing the last lesson in our series of questions from the youth. And next week we'll get into the adults questions, but this morning we're finishing this series out and I save this lesson for last on purpose. Uh, because this question is one I think most of us struggle with and I wanted plenty of time to think about this and how to really answer it. The question is actually three questions that all go together. Can a Christian lose salvation? How do you get out of the lukewarm cycle? And how should a Christian act day to day? 
When you make a commitment to Christ, what typically happens is you are on fire. You start out on fire. You are a highly motivated Christian. And then time passes. You lose a little bit of that motivation. And life goes on. You find yourself not quite the Christian you originally envisioned. Maybe you hang out with some of the wrong people. You develop some bad habits. You've got some temptations that you're struggling with. And one day you look at your walk with Christ and you find it's just really not as good as you hoped it would be. But then you decide, you know what, I'm going to get better. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to make a change. You get motivated again. You start putting in the effort. And now you're doing much better. Now you're back where you should be. And then time passes. Life goes on. And you're back down again. And over time, what you find is that you're caught in this frustrating cycle of ups and downs. You're on fire, and then you're lukewarm. You're doing what you should do, living exactly how you should, and then you're not. It's constant and annoying and frustrating. And it can lead some people to say, what is wrong with me? Why can't I just stay on fire? Why can't I stay on the right path, just keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Why do I have to keep ending up in this spiritual low place? Am I a bad Christian? Am I not the person Christ wants? Am I more bad than good? Am I just really that messed up? To the first question, can a Christian lose salvation? The answer is yes. The Bible tells us that we can, in fact, lose our salvation. We'll look at just a couple passages about this. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, For it is impossible, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. Notice it's talking about people who have once been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift and shared in the Holy Spirit. It is talking about someone who had salvation. They were Christians. They had their sins forgiven. And then verse 6, and then have fallen away. This passage says it is impossible to restore them again to repentance. Not only did they fall away, it says they are crucifying once again the Son of God. That's not good. They had salvation, they lost it, and now they are in a really, really bad place. We'll come back to this in just a second. Let's look at 2 Peter 2, 20 and 21. For if... After they've escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Here again, they escaped the defilements of the world. How'd they do that? through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are saved, they have salvation, and then they are again entangled in them and overcome. So they go right back to where they were before, and they lose their salvation. Peter says that for these people, their last state has become worse for them than the first. He says it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness. These two passages are kind of scary. They're scary especially for anyone struggling with the temptation. Because here's how I was thinking when I was younger. The way I was thinking was, I'm, I'm a Christian. I have salvation. I've been saved from my sins. Then I did something bad. So that means I'm crucifying Christ all over. Now I'm in a worse state than I was before I was ever baptized. What I just did, that bad thing, whatever it was, is what Peter says. I became entangled in the defilements of the world. I was overcome by it. I have fallen away. 
I've lost my salvation. I am condemned to hell. Because I did that one bad thing. This is incorrect thinking. But why was I thinking that way? Well, frankly, it's because what I had been taught by the church. See, there's a teaching out there that says once saved, always saved. Meaning, once you're saved, you can't possibly lose your salvation. It doesn't matter what you do. You're good. Well, that's wrong. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible clearly says you can lose your salvation. The problem is that in trying to refute that doctrine, the church really came down hard on the fact that you can lose it, you can fall away, and the result of that turned into you better be on guard you better watch out because every second of your life you are teetering on the edge of the pits of hell. And all it takes is that one sin to push you right in and you are done. Here's the problem with that. I also had the understanding that if I sinned, I had lost my salvation, I was going to hell, but if I prayed to God and repented, of that sin, well, now I'm good again. Now I'm restored. Now I'm on the right side of things. But what's Hebrews 6 say? Hebrews 6 said, For it is impossible to restore them again. Well, I know I can be restored. I know I can have forgiveness after I mess up. So maybe this passage isn't talking about that situation where 16-year-old Michael got mad in a basketball game because he got fouled and the ref didn't call it and he said something he shouldn't have said. And now he's condemned to hell. Maybe that's not what that passage is talking about. What we have to understand is that these passages are talking about someone who was a Christian and then for whatever reason, they turned their back on Christ. They left the faith. For good. They didn't mess up once. They made a decision to not follow Christ anymore. What these passages are talking about is someone who is an apostate. That is a word meaning a person who renounces a religion or a belief. The answer is yes, you can lose your salvation. But I would suggest that if you're struggling with something, you haven't lost it yet. If temptation is getting the best of you, but you're fighting, and you're fighting, and you're fighting, the fact that you're still fighting and haven't given up is a pretty good indication you're still in the faith. You're still fighting for the faith. You're still on the right path. You may be getting beat up. And it may seem like a losing fight. But you haven't turned your back on Christ yet. You haven't forsaken God and decided you're just throwing in the towel and calling it quits. Something we need to understand is that when we're in that cycle, that spiritual up and down, just because we're down doesn't mean we've lost our salvation. Just because we're at a spiritual low point doesn't mean we're going to hell. When we are at a spiritual low point, what that means is we're at a spiritual low point. The end. That's it. Could we be better? Sure. Do we wish it were better? Absolutely. Would we like to get out of that place and be on fire again? Of course we would. And we should work towards that. We should do what we need to do to fix the problem and get back to where we should be. But we don't need to send ourselves into an existential crisis because we think we're the worst person in the world. God hates us and we're forever destined to hell. All right, well, if we had a choice, we would just never be in that cycle to begin with, right? Given a choice, we'd be on fire all the time. So how do we stay on fire, highly motivated, forever and ever, and never fall into that slump again? How do we get out of that lukewarm cycle and stay motivated? Here's the answer. You don't. You don't. It's a great thought, but it's not reality. That's not how life works. A lot of 
people, especially young people, after experiencing these ups and downs, they think there has to be a way to stop the downs. Life is down, then I'm up, then I'm down, then I'm up. But is there a magic solution? Is there a way to stay up and never go down again? I got to find the secret. I got to learn the trick. We want our life to look like this. I'll eventually get up and stay up. But it's not realistic. And I think what we need to do is change our expectation of what our life is going to look like. Instead of trying to maintain this high, we should instead think about simply improving our overall walk with Christ. Paul says in Galatians 5.25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. That's what we need to focus on. And if we understand and accept, there are going to be highs and lows. We're not always going to be on fire, but we can live by the Spirit. We can keep in step with the Spirit. Then our life might start to instead look like this. And this is a far better goal to have. Because it takes into account the reality and the fact that we're going to go through ups and downs. But notice what happens right here. Our ups are higher than they were before. And our downs aren't as low as they were before. It's the ebb and flow of life, but we're getting stronger and stronger and stronger. We're getting better and better and better. I find a lot of metaphors in athletics. And so I tell all of my jumpers when I'm coaching them that they've got to manage, uh, manage their expectations because there are going to be some track meets where they are just on, everything's clicking, they're performing exactly as they want to, and then there are going to be meets where they just can't seem to get anything going. They're just off. They don't perform well. Here's a picture of two of my athletes at our last track meet one week ago. Don't be fooled by the smiles and the thumbs up. They are not happy. They're putting on happy faces, but right before I took this picture, I was sitting in a corner of the facility in different corners with each of them as they bawled their eyes out. Worst performance of the year for both of them. Like, it was terrible. It, it was bad. And they knew it. But if they had done that exact same performance, hit all the exact same marks two years ago when they were freshmen, they'd be celebrating because they'd be setting personal records. It would have been the best performance they've ever had two years ago. That's what happens when you grow and when you get stronger and when you get better. The goal is to have those ups and downs in a way that eventually you get to the point where the down is higher than what the up used to be. The goal is to compare who I am today with who I was a few years ago. My highs are getting higher and my lows are getting not as low. How do you get out of the cycle? You don't. Life is a cycle. But you can use that cycle to your advantage and you can make it something that is positive and beneficial. So given all that, the final part of the question is how should a Christian act day to day? If I'm a Christian and I'm supposed to be living like a Christian, being a Christian, what's that actually look like in my day to day? If I'm getting stronger and stronger, what's that look like? It's a tough one growing up for me because quite often we define our Christian behavior as what we don't do. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Don't be involved in sexual immorality. Don't put anything ahead of God. Don't do this. Don't do that. Okay, I, I can cut that stuff out. Now what am I supposed to actually do? I often heard sermons preached about the fruit of the Spirit. We should be people who have the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. To be honest with you, I never liked this passage. 
The reason I never liked it is because it's too vague for me. I want things spelled out. It says goodness. All right, but what's that look like in my life? What is goodness? Gentleness. Sure. How? What am I supposed to do? How am I showing my gentleness? What is, what's that look like? What I really wanted was the Bible to tell me, if you're going to be a Christian, well, you need to read three chapters of your Bible every single day. You need to pray to God a minimum of three times a day. You need to say one positive and encouraging thing to somebody every day. You need to invite no less than five people to church per week, so on and so forth. I want the checklist. Tell me what it looks like. What do I have to do every single day? And the checklist isn't there. It just says things like love, kindness, self-control. What it took me a long time to realize is that the fruit of the Spirit, the standard that I'm supposed to be living up to, it's not a checklist. It's about developing a certain character. It's not about what I'm doing. It's about what sort of person I am and am becoming. If I'm that kind of person, then the action will follow. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 5, 8 through 17. <clears throat> For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of thing, the things they do in secret. But whenever any, anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We are supposed to walk as children of light. Okay. What's that mean? That's kind of vague again. But verse 10, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Verse 17, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Romans 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. I think what all of this is telling us is that we are supposed to be the sort of people who are trying to figure out God's will in our lives. And it's not going to look the same for all of us. but be the person who's trying to discern it. Be the person who's looking into it. Be the person who is seeking it. How should a Christian act day to day? Well, if you're in school, you should be asking, what does God want me to do at this school? What does the will of God look like for me in this place? Are there people I can reach out to? Is there goodness I can show? How can I show gentleness? I need to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So what is it? We should have a certain character about us, that wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever situation we're in, that, that is the question at the forefront of our minds. What is the will of God in this place? Instead of just doing what the world wants and going in the same direction as everyone else, we first stop and we say, is this pleasing to God? Is this the will of God? Can I do something positive here? Or is this going to end up being negative? There is no checklist. There is no way to say, well, a, a Christian makes sure to do this and that and this and that every single day. No. What the Christian does every day is simply try to please God. Whatever form that takes, however that works, is this the will of God? Is this showing love? Will it bring joy? Does it contribute to peace? Am I demonstrating patience? How can I show kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness? Do I have 
self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit found in our character. And our character is developed by always pursuing the will of God. Yes, we can lose our salvation. But just because you're at a low point in your life doesn't mean you've lost it. It just means you are a normal human being who goes through ups and downs. And there's no way around that. It's going to happen. So through it all, up or down, wherever you are in that cycle, you need to be pursuing the will of God and simply doing your best to discern what is pleasing to Him. All of this starts by committing your life to Christ. If you haven't already turned your life over to Him, repented of your sins and been baptized, then everything I've said so far is a moot point. The beginning of it all is giving yourself to Him. If you need to do that this morning, we offer the invitation to do that. You can come to the front. We'll be happy to help you with it. If you have another need, this invitation is for you as well. Please come while we stand and sing. For a second, promise not to hold you up for too long. I'm waiting on some of the folks to come up from downstairs that have been in children's church. I sent Alan the text, like he said. So we're going to play a couple of videos for you guys who uh, were not able to participate or haven't seen. Um, we had, uh, from Winterfest, we had two young ladies decide to be baptized while one while we were there and one immediately when we we got back so we got the videos to share with you one of them is uh not here today she is sick but the other is actually downstairs doing children's church so we're trying to get her uh get the kids back up here so they can they can watch and participate as well so we'll give them just a minute to get up here um but just so to kind of tell a little bit about each of them um like a sludel is Gabby, many of you remember, Gabby got baptized uh, way back uh, when we went to West Memphis this past year, and both of them have been attending uh, quite regular, and uh, Laika decided that she was going to make the decision to get baptized. She's been uh, hanging out with uh, the OMB family and dating Hayden. You guys, come on in. Come on. Come on. Come on. And... Um, J.C. Bergman, who uh, started working with Ella a few months ago, and she, uh, if, if she's walking in right now, 
So uh, if you're in need of some extra energy, she has plenty to go around. She is a student right now at ETSU, uh, so I'll be in prayer for her for that, but she, she makes sure she's been to nearly every youth event we've had in the last several months, and she also, we had already planned for actually to get baptized today so some of her family could be here, but she couldn't wait at Winterfest. She was ready, and uh, so we took care of that then. So you got the videos queued up. Uh, so we have their names and addresses in the bulletin, and so after the videos of whoever's got the closing prayer would like to come up and do that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Are you ready? Are you going to pee your pants? You know what? These are all the same people you've been with all weekend. It's okay. There's no new ones. That's your mom. <laughs> here, here, come on. You got You got it. Just focus on a dot on the wall. Come on, pick one. Come on, you don't have to look in. Step. Another step. Okay. Walk on out. Two more steps. Whoa. Don't run. Don't run. All right, sit down. Are you okay? So, how long can we talk? Not long. So... Uh, we're really proud, like she's been coming here for, I don't know, how long have you been coming here now? Several months. Um, and at first, she wasn't real sure about all of the Jesus stuff, uh, and so we just kind of let her learn on her own and develop and ask questions, and I, I would like to think that uh, dating Hayden has had something to do with helping her make this decision. Um, So, uh, but after going to Winterfest, as, as often happens when we go there and, and they see the manner in which uh, the folks there put the, all the effort in, and emotion that comes from being there and all of the songs and worship that we do and then hearing all the speakers, you know, it has an effect, whether 
we realize it or not. And so, uh, in her making this decision, I kind of was hoping that she would. Um, I told her that I was getting older and I couldn't retire until one day she decided to get baptized when we were walking in, and she didn't want that kind of pressure, right? So, but um, so we're going to baptize Lyca today and welcome her into the family of Christ. Are you ready? You want me to shut up now? All right, like I said, I have, like I said, I have two questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, mine, and everyone else's here? Do you believe? Or are you going to, from this day forward, make him the Lord of your life? Yes, yes, that's the, that's the answer we were looking for. So now we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and when we do, you'll receive a gift. A gift they were talking about this weekend in the Holy Spirit to help you along. Because crap is still going to be tough. Life is still hard. It doesn't matter if you're following Christ or not, but Christ gives you people to lean on, all of these people. They're, they're here for you to lean on. They're here for me. They'll be here for you. Okay? I'm going to hand off this mic. Let's pray together. Our Lord God, we're so thankful today for these commitments that JC and Lyca have made for the joy of witnessing their baptisms. Let me pray for your hand to be upon them and strengthen them and teach them as they begin this walk. We are so grateful for this fellowship of believers. That we can share together our faith and our love. We're thankful for the lesson we've heard this morning to be reminded that we are still your people. You still hold us in your hand even during down times. And maybe we don't feel as strong. Help us to trust in you through those times, to lean on our brothers and sisters to lift us up, that we may always shine as your people everywhere we go. Be with us through this day and the coming week that our lives will reflect your love, that we will be servants for you. In Jesus' name, amen.